Okay, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews Night 2, and on today's video we'll be taking a look at MSI's MAG B450M Mortar Wi-Fi. This is a micro ATX motherboard for Intel LGA1200 chips, and is uh, pretty much one of the best boards that I've come across so far, and a few of you have asked to see what the BIOS looks like, so this video is basically a walkthrough of the BIOS. So currently this is set to the standard easy mode, if you want to change from easy mode to advanced mode, you can press F7 or click on the tab up here and this will take you into the advanced mode. Bizarrely it says easy mode when it's in that, but it's basically to toggle it between the two. So this is the standard mode. As you can see, this is Saturday the 30th of January 2021. Currently our CPU speed is 3.6 gigahertz. This is using a Intel 10100F chipset is the B460, as we said. Uh, you've got the CPU details in the top here. Memory size, 16 gigs. And our current BIOS revision is uh, 0 0.130, which was available from the 10th of the 7th, 2020. So actually quite an old BIOS. We will be doing a BIOS update video, so if you want to see how to update the BIOS on this board, then don't forget to click on the subscribe button and all that usual YouTube stuff, and just keep an eye out on your feed, and that will be coming up very, very soon. So in the main section, we've got, again, uh, DDR speeds. Now, DDR speeds on this board is, is something of a uh, bit of a nightmare, really. It's quite locked down, as is the CPU itself. So the DDR speed with a i3 or an i5 or lower processor, maximum speed that the system will allow is a DDR2666. If you're using an i7 or an i9 processor on this board, then you can get it up to a whopping 2933 megahertz, which is still a little bit shy of what AMD will allow us. Intel chips aren't as affected by high speed memory as AMD. So, anyway, moving on. So, in this top corner, we've got Game Boost, which currently uh, isn't available. The Game Boost is essentially for K series chips, so you can unlock those. Next up, we've got our XMP profile for our RAM, so you can actually enable. Uh, the profile if you want to so normally this ram that i've got i think is uh, 2400 but if you add the xmp profile it will basically try and run xmp but obviously at the lower frequencies across the top here we've got our usual information so cpu core temperature which is currently running at 37 38 degrees with the stock intel cooler if you want to see how to install a cooler on this board uh, click on the links or click on the eye in the top corner and you can see how that is done motherboard temperature 36 degrees in our colink citadel case V-Core voltage, DDR voltage, and currently our BIOS mode is in UEFI rather than CSM, which is the compatibility mode. Boot priority is here, so you can drag and drop these, so you can just hold the left click on the mouse button and you can slide those along to whichever position you want them to. Ideally, you want your primary boot drive to be at the first position, so at the moment we've got our UEFI hard disk, which is the Windows Boot Manager. Obviously, if you've got more than one disk, then this is quite handy for selecting your boot priority without going into the advanced mode. So that's it for this top section. On the left-hand side, we've got CPU, memory, storage, fan info, and the help section. So in CPU, it goes in and tells us about our CPU, all the features which are enabled, Intel Turbo Boost, etc., hyper-threading, virtualization, and execute disable bits. CPU ratio is listed, and the number of cores, etc., etc. Also, our CPU base clock which is 100 megahertz. Moving down to memory, so this tells us our DRAM frequency and also tells you which slots are full. So if you've maybe got a system and it's not registering full amount of RAM, probably worth checking in here to see if it's actually physically recognized on the system. And also it tells us our XMP profile for the RAM. Currently we've got some Corsair RAM installed, which uh, which is DDR4-3000 um, with those uh, relatively tight timings, not too bad at all. Only option here is XMP Profile 1, that's the only one that's stored on the RAM chips. And our PCH limit, or our frequency for memory, is 2666, as stated here, and also the limitation of the i3 and i5 chips. Moving down into storage, so currently our storage mode is AHCI, which we can change at the bottom over here, so AHCI or RAID. Most people are, probably won't be using RAID these days, but certainly it is an option if you want to. This also is a good place to check, so if you've got a drive installed and it's not picking up in BIOS or you're unable to access it within Windows, then you make sure that the SATA ports here are listed or your M.2 slots are listed for your appropriate drive. Moving down, we've got fan information, so this is uh, relatively basic on the fan information. So currently we've got our CPU stroke pump fan, so that is the current statistics for that. So 85C is 100%, again you can change this if you want to. 
this bit is uh, purely uh, for demonstration purposes. If you want to actually make changes, you click on the cog, and then that will open the hardware monitor. But we'll take a look at that later when we go into the advanced mode. So it tells you fan speed, core temperatures, etc. System fans gives you the options of which ones are connected. So currently we've got system fan two connected, which has got our set of fans which come from the Coolink Citadel case. So that is the uh, the curve that I've set up for that to keep things a little bit cooler and also quieter. Again, if you want to change those go into the settings cog to go into hardware information or hardware monitor. Next up is the help button. So click on help and it basically tells you what the individual keys do. So if for some reason you're stuck in a menu and you're not too sure what to do, then it tells you what to do. Uh, one which I actually find quite helpful is the F10, which is save and reset. So quite often if you're uh, doing stuff in here and you're not sure how to actually get out or it's, there's no real save and exit button. So knowing it's F10, pretty handy. You can also as well, if you click on the X at the top, it will actually tell you if you want to save configuration and exit. So that is the default setting for this particular board. Uh, we don't want to do that yet, so we're going to close that. Uh, moving down, we've got M flash. So if you want to flash the BIOS in easy mode or advanced mode, same principles. So you can click on M flash and it will actually reboot and enter the system's BIOS flashing mode. If you want to continue, just click yes. If you don't, click no. Obviously, if you're flashing the BIOS, make sure you've got the USB drive with the correct firmware or BIOS for your board. Moving down, you've got favorites, so you can uh, make changes there, so you can add items into your favorites. Again, I don't know why they add that these days. Uh, yeah, Entirely up to you if you want to set favorites, but uh, most people probably won't do. Moving down to the bottom, we've got our hardware monitor, which is what most people will probably be using on a regular basis. Again, we'll check out this in more detail when we go into advanced mode. By the way, if you're looking for any specific feature on this particular video, then do check the timestamps in the video description and you can go straight into the bit which is relevant to you. So moving across to this bottom section, so you've got the CPU fan failing warning control. So if your fan stops spinning or maybe a cable gets stuck in the blades, then you get a warning as you boot up the system saying that your CPU fan has failed, which can be handy if you're using water cooling or again, if you've got slightly untidy wiring and your fan has failed. Just a, a safety feature, so you can have that enabled or disabled. To enable or disable any of these, you just click on them and it will select or deselect it. Next one up is the ERP Ready, so that is the ERP 2013 standard for energy saving, etc. So if you're in an environment or a workplace which demands that, or even if you're in a country which demands it, you can enable or disable it. If you disable it, you will get slightly better performance at the offset of slightly higher power usage. At the bottom, we've got the HD audio controller. So if you want to use the onboard audio, then leave that enabled. If you're using a separate sound card or a, a USB DAC, something along those lines, then you can just click on that. When there's no red dot there, means it's disabled. With it, with a red dot, means it's enabled, as you can see. Moving over, so we've got the uh, M.2 stroke Optane Genie. So you can go through and configure that. We haven't got an Optane module installed, so uh, no need for that on our particular setup. This section here is for the AHCI or RAID, so if you're using a standard normal SSD or hard drive and normal Windows installation, then you'd normally set that to AHCI. If you want to set up some form of RAID, so RAID 1, RAID 0, RAID 5, etc, etc, then you can enable that and turn on RAID. Whichever one is highlighted in red will be which is applicable to the system. If you do set RAID, obviously it will use some of your SATA ports as RAID ports rather than SATA ports. So do be careful, make sure you know what you're doing before you enable or disable this feature. Uh, moving down to the bottom, this is one which some of you may uh, probably be looking for while you've searched out this video, and that is your easy LED control. So this, um, a little bit confusing, the description of it, but essentially what it means is, do you want to have RGB on your motherboard or your peripherals? So if you've got a possibly a pre-built system with this board, and it's uh, decked out with tons and tons of bling, RGB, lights flashing everywhere, but you are not very keen on that, then if you go into easy LED control and click on it, so there's no red dot there, that will then disable all the RGB LEDs on the subsequent reboot. That setting will hold, so even if you've got something like MSI uh, Dragon Center and you've got RGB configured in there, it will override that, basically it disables the RGB entirely. As you guys probably know, I do like my RGB, so we'll leave that enabled. So that is pretty much it for the easy mode, so let's uh, head on over into the advanced mode. Actually, before we do that, a couple of other things at the top here. So F12, so you can take a screenshot, which will save to a USB stick. Uh, also, you've got the 
search. So if there's something you're specifically looking for, you can uh, search in that search box. Just type it in using your keyboard. You can use up, down, left, right to search through any options which come up. Also, you've got your language for the BIOS, so you can change it. So if you want to uh, play a prank on someone, you can obviously change the uh, the BIOS language. Do make sure you know what you're doing when you're doing this. Because if you do change it, you may not see the layout the same, so you may not be able to change it back. So uh, yeah, do be careful. And as we said previously, in the top corner is the X, which basically means to save the configuration and exit out of your UEFI BIOS. So we're going to not cancel that for now. So let's head on into advanced mode. So again, very, very similar, just a few more extra features available to you and some other things which you can drill into to get a little bit more flexibility of your system. Because we're using i3 on this particular build, some of the options are going to be uh, irrelevant, but certainly we'll go through them and mention them just so you know where they are. So starting off with motherboard settings over on this left-hand side, the rest of it around the top is uh, pretty much identical as you can see. So we'll just uh, drill straight into these. So settings, first of all. So you've got your usual one, system status which gives you information, time, date, uh, drives that are present, etc. Microcode version, BIOS versions, all that kind of stuff. Also, you've got your DMI information, which is the kind of the default string. So when you go into Windows, it tells it what board it is, serial numbers, all that kind of stuff. Going back into, going back into advanced. So in advanced, we've got uh, quite a few different menus here. So we've got our PCI Express, PCI subsystem settings. So you've got your speed limitations. So if you've got maybe a PCI Express Gen 4 graphics card or Gen 2 or whatever it is, you're having issues with PCI Express, then you can set your maximum link speed. Generally, setting it to auto is going to be your best bet. Next up, you've got your PCI latency timer. So generally, the lower latency, the better. But certainly, if you're overclocking or there's a slightly older component or something, then you can actually change the latency to um, make it longer or slower, whichever the case may be. So also then you've got above 4G memory, so cryptocurrency mining, that's uh, disabled. If you're not too sure what any of these things are, it does pop up on the section in the help. So you can go into there and also there's information about the system. So if you're not too sure what a setting is, you can just leave it on help and it tells you what it is. So this section is to enable, uh, sorry, enable this item to allow more memory address configuration space, uh, requires 64-bit OS with other optimized settings for better device compatibility, it might slightly affect the efficiency of PCI Express devices. Generally, the default setting on here is fine. Obviously, if you are doing crypto mining or something, then maybe you would like to enable that feature. Next one up is your ACPI settings. So that is basically power management. So you've got your power LED, so when it's in uh, sleep, etc., that kind of thing. And also your over temperature alert. Next up is our integrated peripherals. So this is going to cover things like your VGA, VGA card detection. If you're using it in some kind of, um, I don't know, headless unit, you possibly could get it to work without a graphics card. Again, you can get it to ignore a GPU if you want to use your onboard graphics, those kinds of things. Generally, that's best set to auto. Also got your onboard LAN controller, so you can enable or disable that. Also, you can enable or disable a boot ROM from the LAN or the ability to boot from a LAN ROM. Also, you've got network stack, which is uh, basically a stack for optimizing IP4 and IP6 functions. Generally, this is best left to disabled unless you have a specific need for it. And also, this is probably what some of you may be looking for, the onboard Wi-Fi stroke Bluetooth control module. So you can set it to either it's automatic, Wi-Fi only, Bluetooth only, and Wi-Fi Bluetooth off. So in this particular instance, if you've got, for instance, you're in a environment where you've got a decent wired connection, you may not want your Wi-Fi to be active as well for hindering Windows performance, etc. So you can set it so it's only Bluetooth, so you can use a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse or a Bluetooth headset. Or conversely, uh, if you don't want to use any Bluetooth and you're a bit concerned about Bluetooth radiation or that kind of stuff, then you can choose Wi-Fi only, or you can disable the whole thing altogether. But Generally, because you've bought this board, the mortar Wi-Fi, which is a little bit more expensive than the standard mortar board, then generally I think you're probably going to want this uh, on. So leave it set to auto, and that is both on. Next up is our SATA configuration. So you've got the SATA mode. Again, this is basically a different version of the other one. So you can set it to RAID or Optane or AHCI. AHCI is generally the normal mode. Then you've also got the ability for hot plug against the six SATA ports. So you can choose enabled or disabled. 
Um, moving down towards the bottom, we've got our HD audio controller. Again, options for that is either enabled or disabled. So again, if you're using a separate sound card or maybe you're using a 7.1 plug-in USB headphone set, which has got its own audio controller, you don't necessarily need the HD audio one, so you can uh, disable that if you want to. Most people will probably leave that enabled. Again, your choice entirely. Next up is the uh, Thunderbolt. So you can choose for discrete Thunderbolt support. There is actually a header on this motherboard for adding an additional Thunderbolt card. Whether you use that or not is entirely up to you. Obviously, if you have bought the discrete Thunderbolt card and you want to use it, then you will need to set this to enabled. If you set to enabled and you haven't got the card actually physically installed, this will not still give you Thunderbolt. You do have to have that discrete card installed. Moving back, let's go our USB configuration. So this is uh, pretty basic stuff. Essentially, you've got the uh, XHCI handoff, which basically allows boards or systems that don't support USB 3.0 or devices. Uh, basically, it gives it some kind of backwards compatibility. So I'm um, trying to think of an operating system, maybe if you're installing some sort of emulation or an older operating system, Windows 2000 maybe, Windows 98, whatever crazy thing you want to do, Potentially, you could uh, use the USB 3 ports on that, but they will default as USB 2. Also, you've got USB legacy support. So this is designed so for, again, older operating systems that don't support USB input. Maybe if you've got an older operating system uh, or a custom operating system, which is looking for a PS2 keyboard and mouse, then this will basically allow you to use a USB keyboard and mouse with an older system. And you've also got USB port control. So you can choose which ports are enabled or disabled. If you wanted to disable ports, maybe you're in a business environment and you just want people to be able to use a keyboard and mouse and that is it, not plug any USB devices in, you can go through and disable or enable specific ports. Next up, we've got our power management setup. So uh, you've got the option for ERP ready, which we discussed earlier about the ERP regulations. So if you do have to have uh, specific controls over your energy usage, then you can enable or disable that. Restore after AC power loss, so you can set it so if your system is uh, auto booting and there's some sort of power outage, if you've got maybe a slightly dirty power supply or dirty incoming power, then you can set it to either be powered off, so it stays off, uh, default to power on, or whatever the last state was. So uh, Generally, I think most people in the UK, clean power supplies, power off, would probably be absolutely fine, but again, you can choose that however you want to. System power fault protection, so if the uh, the voltage is not quite right in the power supply or whatever, then it can stop the system from booting. You can use have that as enabled or disabled. And USB standby power at S4, S5, so if you're in some sort of low power system and you don't turn your PC off and you want it to basically wake up via USB, you will need to have this set as it says on the side there. So set enabled to allow standby power on all USB ports allowing to be adjusted manually when resumed by USB device was set as disabled. Yeah, a little bit confusing, but essentially, yeah, if you want to uh, wake up your device via USB keyboard and mouse or keyboard press or whatever it might be, then you will need that either enabled or disabled depending on your setup needs. Next up is the BIOS CSM UEFI mode. So as we said before, this is in UEFI or you can use compatibility mode for older systems or older devices, older, basically older stuff. Most people are going to use that as UEFI. Again, most of these settings are probably best left as standard unless you know exactly what they're for. Uh, DTM, I've got to be honest with you, I've got no idea what that is at all. It doesn't have any help or info on the side there. It defaults is disabled, so yeah, I'm uh, not too sure what that is at all. If you know, let us know in the comments. Um, I might actually look that up later, and if I do find it, I'll put it in this timestamp as a, a reference point. So you've got wake up event setup. So again, wake up by BIOS, wake up by RTC alarm, PCI device, USB device. You can use all those for resume, etc. Most of this stuff is handled much better in Windows. So yeah, leave all these as they are and then let Windows take care of your power management settings. Secure Race Plus, so that is uh, for basically making an SSD faster. So you can basically erase it and all that kind of stuff. It will delete everything on the SSD. And also you've got the NVMe SSD self-test. And if you've got a compatible drive which supports, I think it's NVMe version 1.3, you can go in there and uh, basically do a test on your drive, make sure it's all okay make sure there's no uh, issues with voltage or blocks, that kind of stuff. So that is it for the uh, advanced section. I think we've pretty much gone through all that. So we go back into boot. 
So in our boot options, we've got options for the full screen logo display. So that is when the system boots up and you get the MSI logo. You can choose to have that enabled or disabled. Uh, go to BIOS is basically you can s enable that, which is an easier way of accessing the BIOS. So you can press and hold the power button for four seconds when you start up and it will go into the, uh, the BIOS screen rather than you having to press delete or however you choose to get into your BIOS. Next up is your boot up numlock state again on or off. So if you're using a 10 keyless keyboard, you can leave that off. Um, or if you use your arrow keys on your number pad, then you can choose that on or off. Most people I think will probably leave that set to on. Uh, info block effect. This is basically for the animations within the UEFI BIOS. So basically it's just smoother transitions between uh, game have that enabled or disabled doesn't seem to make much difference either way. Post beep, so if you've got a BIOS speaker connected to your motherboard, you can have that enabled or disabled, in your choice entirely. And you've got MSI fast boot, which basically is kind of a similar sort of deal as the Windows fast boot. It's basically allowing the system to boot up a little bit quicker. Generally, um, I would leave this as disabled. Fast boot, in my opinion, is uh, more problematic and also does have issues with certain USB devices. I have found actually, even with MSI's own keyboard, the GK30, which we reviewed, which you can check out, um, if I have fast boot enabled, for some reason the keyboard goes a little bit crazy and won't uh, initialize properly. So, personally, I would leave fast boot disabled and the standard fast boot for Windows 8. I would leave that disabled as well. Personal preference, but entirely up to you. Boot options, so you can go into boot options and choose your boot order like we did at the top with the uh, drag and drop. So that's all pretty much uh, standard stuff. Again, if you want to uh, disable the ability to boot from a USB or CD, then you can go through these and just choose disabled and they will no longer be allowed as bootable devices. If you lock the device after in the BIOS, set a password, that kind of stuff, then obviously that is uh, quite useful. At the bottom, we've got the uh, UEFI hard drive BBS. So if you've got more than one drive, you can choose your boot option. So which one boots first? Pretty standard stuff. Next up is security. So as we touched on just now, you can set a administrator password or a user password for the BIOS. So if you don't want anybody to make any changes or maybe you've locked down the USB ports, you can use all that kind of stuff. You can set a password here. Trusted computing. So if you've got a TPM device installed, then you can go in and set all that stuff up here. I guess that is more for the kind of business environments, uh, so most people will not use that, but again, it is an option. Uh, chassis intrusion configuration. So there is actually a pin on the motherboard which you can connect up a chassis intrusion device. Again, more business orientated than anything, so this will give a notification if the system has been opened by a uh, user, etc. You can have that enabled or disabled. And also you've got your secure boot. So if you've got secure boot for Windows or you've got a platform key, all that kind of stuff, this is where you can do all your key management. So that is it. So then uh, in settings, save and exit is uh, probably the one most of you kind of want to use. So you can click on save and exit and you can either choose to discard the changes and exit. So you're not sure you've made the right changes, save changes and reboot. Uh, you can restore the factory BIOS defaults, which is sometimes handy if you've had some kind of overclocking glitches or you've made some changes which have caused problems and you don't know what it is. And also you've got your boot override. So this is actually quite handy. So if you've gone into the BIOS and you've configured it all and you want to boot from a USB device rather than your SSD, which may be installed, you can choose which one you want to boot to on the next attempt. That will only boot for one attempt. It won't override it indefinitely, just for the, the next reboot. Right, so overclocking settings. So OC Explore mode, so you've got options for normal or expert. Again, depending on what you want to do, this will change some of the layouts here. So. Uh, we'll leave it as expert. So CPU settings, first of all, got CPU ratio apply mode. So this is applying if you want the offsets per core, turbo ratio, blah, 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 etc. Generally, unless you know what you're doing, this is probably best left alone. Next up is the CPU ratio. So if you're overclocking manually on a K-series chip, then you can go ahead and put in a manual CPU ratio. So for instance, with this particular CPU, normally it's 36, which is basically times it by 10. So the CPU speed would be 36. If it's a K chip, you could obviously change that to 37, 38, etc., etc. Also, it'll tell you your adjusted CPU frequency. So if you do make any changes, it should appear there. This is grayed out, so that is all we can do. So CPU advanced configuration. So you've got hyper-threading. So this is basically setting all the things that you're probably more interested in. So hyper-threading enabled, you should really enable that unless you've got some reason why you don't. Uh, active processor cores, you can disable cores if you want to uh, or set it to all. 
Intel Adaptive Thermal Monitor, leave that uh, leave that engaged because that is kind of like your overheat temperatures and settings and basically keeps the processor alive. Uh, Intel C-State, so that is basically power management, so you can have that enabled or disabled or set it to auto. Auto is probably your best bet. C1E support, again, more power management and basically goes into a lower power saving state. I generally leave that disabled because I don't tend to use it, but if you've got a PC which is always on, you may prefer to enable that. Uh, package C-state limit, so depending what your C-state limit is, you can choose to auto or you can lower the C levels, so obviously that is energy efficiency ratings. I'm going to leave that as auto. Uh, CPU current limit, this is one where you can, um, I'm not sure if you can actually make any changes on here, so auto currently is set to 210 amps, so let's try 209. That's actually 209 as hell, so you can actually change that. Um, if you delete it, press enter, it goes back to normal, so again, you can play around with that and see if you can get a little bit more out of your processor. CPU light load control, so you can change settings there, normal or advanced, if you go into advanced, you've got your uh, load line calibrations and stuff like that. So AC and DC, again, those are set to auto. If you know what you're doing, you can tweak those a little bit, see if you can get a bit more performance, entirely up to you. TVB ratio clipping, so this is, again is more advanced stuff, unless you know what you're doing for overclocking, I would certainly leave that well alone, but certainly the feature is there if you wish to tweak it. TVB voltage optimizations, uh, again, auto enabled or disabled. Most of this stuff I would leave as auto, again, a lot of it you probably can't change depending on the processor you're on, but if you're rocking a 99 top end, then maybe you might want to change these a little bit. So F-clock frequency, so you can set that to auto 400, 800, or 1000. F-clock, you're probably best off again leaving that as it is, unless you have a specific reason to change it. DMI link speed, so this is basically, DMI is Intel's version of kind of like the, um, the PCI Express Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3 thing. Essentially it works the same way, it's just a, a different way or a, a more proprietary way of doing it. So you've got your DMI link speeds you can change from auto, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3. This board doesn't support Gen 4, so uh, you're limited to those generations. So you can set it to auto. Intel speed shift technology, again, processor dependent mostly. You can leave that to auto, enabled or disabled. CPU, PCIe spread spectrum. So sped, spread spectrum, um, sometimes this can help with things like instability, power issues, uh, interference that kind of stuff so you can have that enabled or disabled or set to auto we're going to leave it to auto and then we've got our ring ratio so you can change the ring ratio cpu cooler tuning uh, this can be uh, useful in some instances so if you're trying to limit the power that is actually available to the cpu you can actually set it so that it will never max out more than 65 watts if you're using a box cooler uh, if you're using a tower air cooler or water cooler, they basically work the same. So 255 watts is the thermal maximum that it can go through. So yeah, you can set that. It does actually, on the first usage, when you set this board up, it will actually ask you what type of cooler you're using. If you don't select one, it will default to the box cooler. So if you're finding your system is running a little bit slower than it should do, you may be worth checking the CPU cooler tuning to see if it's actually limited to 65 watts. Next up, we've got our uh, DRAM memory profile again we've gone through that so we've enabled xmp although it's not going to go to the full frequency because it's uh, going to default to 2666 depending on uh, what your ram is you can choose individual ones individual settings etc but generally this is probably left on auto because of the limitations of the board next up you've got your memory try it so you can uh, try different memory speeds etc try different cas latencies Generally, again, this is probably left alone because there's not really a great deal you can do with memory on here anyway. DRAM timing mode, again, you've got uh, auto, link, or unlink. This is currently set to link, so I'm going to leave that as it is. Again, if you want to, you can leave it as uh, as auto. Cho choice is yours. Advanced DRAM configuration, so this is where you can go in and you can, well, potentially you can modify the sub-timing configurations, but again, because it's locked down, there's pretty much nothing you can do here, so this is uh, more for reference purposes, really. But certainly, uh, we'll give you some information about your RAM. Memory fast boot again. Um, this is for basically me memory training. So when you first boot up the system with your RAM, the system will try and do memory training to see what um, is actually physically possible with the RAM. 
So you can make changes in here so you can have it so that it's disabled, so it doesn't train enabled, no training or slow training. Slow training will basically go through and change, well, basically try a lot more frequencies before it settles down on one specific one. Again, probably best to set that to auto. Next up, we've got our voltage settings. So digital power, got your load line calibration tool, so you can change that to whatever mode you want to. Again, because this is locked, pretty much uh, you're best off leaving it as auto. Same for your core voltage offset mode. If you want to, you can actually reduce these a little bit if you want to, just to uh, get a little bit more of uh, thermal headroom by reducing the voltage, basically under volting. And that is the same for all of those settings. So you've got your IO voltage, DRAM voltage, etc. The DRAM voltage actually in BIOS is actually a little bit higher than the AMD if alternatives. Uh, on my other board, it's normally about 1.34, 1.33, but this is actually 1.36. So we've got a little bit more extra voltage going to the RAM than we would normally have. Moving down, other settings. So you've got the CPU memory change detect. So this is, uh, yeah, if your memory has been changed, it will actually come up with a warning or try and actually retrain the RAM. You quite often get with uh, AMD boards, they don't recognize the fact that there's different RAM installed and it'll try and run at the previous XMP settings. So this can actually prevent Windows from stalling or from basically getting into your BIOS because of having incorrect memory settings. CPU specifications, again, just shows uh, the processor type and the type of extensions which it supports. Memory Z is uh, again giving you exactly the same stuff, so it tells you about your memory capabilities, what it originally is. So this is originally is a DDR4 2133, which is an XMP profile of 3000, which we can see in here. So 3000 with that particular voltage and those clock ratings. And you can see that for both channels because there is a dual channel. You've got four RAM slots, so you can check all of those. CPU features, uh, again, this might be useful for some of you. So limit CPU ID maximum, uh, Intel virtualization, so you can enable or disable virtualization. So if you're using VMware, that kind of stuff, you want to leave this enabled. Intel VTD tech, again, this is virtual technology, so you can either have that enabled or disabled. Hardware prefetcher, you want that enabled. Uh, and adjacent cache line prefetch, you want that enabled. And CPU EES instructions, you want that enabled. And the CFG lock enabled, you want that enabled as well. The software guard extensions are SGS. You can choose whether it's software controlled, enabled, or disabled. I would personally leave that as software controlled. Again, if you want more information about that kind of stuff, uh, a quick Google search will give you a ton of information on that. So that is it for our uh, overclocking section there. So if we go back, uh, yeah, I think that is definitely everything covered in there. Just making sure. Yep, that is it. So uh, next one up is going to be our M flash. So again, this is how to flash the BIOS. Again, we will do a video on this a little bit later on. So if you want to see that, don't forget to subscribe, all that kind of stuff. And it'll basically reboot, make sure you've got your USB stick installed and the correct flash ROM actually on the stick. But we're not going to do that now. Let's go back and now we go into OC profile. So if you have set an overclocking profile, you can save them in here. Also, you can load them from a USB. So if somebody actually has the same system as you and you want to copy their overclocking settings, you can actually load them from a USB, which is quite handy. Or you obviously you can save to a USB to give to someone else. But um, yeah, it's probably not recommended unless you've got an absolutely identical system. So that is the OC profiles. Next up is our hardware monitor. Again, towards the end now. So this is actually probably where most of you are going to uh, want to go to. If you're using aftermarket RGB fans or fan hubs, this is probably a good place to start off with. So you can change your fan settings. So if for some reason you're not getting an RPM reading on maybe system fan two, for instance on here, then you might want to change to PWM or DC, depending on your particular device. Again, as I said previously, the Dragon Center, even though you've got an option for smart fan or DC control, you do have to change it in the BIOS first before you change it in the Red Dragon software because it doesn't seem to change it over. Also, you can choose for smart fan mode, which you can enable or disable. This basically allows you to set presets. So currently I've got mine set so at 70 degrees for the CPU, which is uh, up here. The fans will be at 100%, which I think I've just changed. And basically it just ramps up as the CPU gets hotter. So 61 degrees is 60%. And at kind of very low um, temperatures or 50 degrees, kind of right down here. And that is basically almost off. Again, you can tweak these as much as you want to, make the fans faster or slower. Also as well, you've got the option for set all fans at full speed, set all defaults. If you do something wrong, you can change the default and set all cancel. 
Also gives you information down here about your CPU socket temperature, your North Bridge, MOSFET system, CPU core, blah, 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 and also your voltages at the bottom. If you've got a couple of system fan headers, again, you can check through the different fan headers. There is a separate CPU and pump fan. You can, if you want to, you can set the pump fan to smart fan mode and you can use it as you would a normal fan header. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like a pump. And obviously if you are using it as a pump, you could just change it to DC and just jack everything up onto full and it'll basically run at full speed. So if, you've, uh, if you're have if doing water cooling, you would maybe want to keep your pump at a constant speed, then certainly you can make changes there. Nice and easy to do. But we haven't got one, so we'll leave that off and leave smart fan mode off. Temperature source you can change, so depending on what it is, so you can choose whether it's your CPU core, the system, MOS, PCH, which is your south bridge, or your CPU socket itself. But we go with CPU core, just generally tends to be easy. You can change those from there as well at the top. So two options there. And you've got your step up times as well. So if you want your, actually let's go back to CPU. So if you want your step up time to be slower or less aggressive, then you can change that. Generally your step down time is probably going to be the one you want to change a little bit, just so that it doesn't kind of, you hear that ramping up. Okay, entirely up to you, work. Use whichever setting works best for you. Certain fans do tend to have more noise than others, so you can change that. I would say for the CPU step up time, I wouldn't change it too much because you want the CPU fan to uh, kind of register speed changes or temperature changes as fast as possible and to try and combat those. But entirely up to you how you do it. Also, again, you can go into help and that will give you information about what you can do in here. So, and also the about section, so yeah, useful information there. But that's pretty much it. So yeah, it gives you a, a line graph of your current temperatures, etc. Can be quite useful for diagnostics in here. So that is the uh, hardware monitor. Next is the board explorer, which basically tells you what you've got installed. So if you click over that, which is your CPU area, it tells you you've got the LGA socket, and currently it's the i3 10100F. RAM wise, it'll tell you details and it'll tell you what other things are. So, fan connector speeds, your SATA ports, and what's plugged in, etc. Pretty handy stuff. Front panel connector shows you where they are. So, if you're not too sure what you're plugging in, although by the time you've got to this, it's probably a little bit late. But so, that is the uh, the kind of board explorer. And then that takes us back to the main menu. So, I think that's going to pretty much wrap this one up. Hopefully, this video has been useful to you. Uh, if you did appreciate it, don't forget to give the video a like and click on subscribe and all that kind of usual YouTube stuff. But I think that's going to wrap it up. I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.